Take your Bible, Psalm 100, if you will. Psalm 100. I know you just took your seat, but would you stand with me at the reading of God's Word? Psalm 100. Five verses. It's not too much effort to honor the Lord, is it? Good. Verse 1, Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. This is one of those psalms that if you have read the psalms, you know this is classic. This is classic because it was a psalm that was used in the temple in connection with the sacrifices that the people would bring sacrifices of thanksgiving and I felt like it would be um, suited for this week it's a psalm that we turn to oftentimes at this time of the year because of the week of thanksgiving but it was a psalm that they would read and that they would meditate on it was a psalm that they would put into practice not just something that they would read as they would enter their time of worship as they would come before the Lord They wanted to make it very clear that the sources of their blessing and all that they possessed and all that was good and the goodness which had been shared with them was from the hand of God. And so they would offer their sacrifices of thanksgiving and gratitude for all that the Lord had done in their life. It's easy in this life that we live to be so caught up in just the running and the going of life, isn't it? And this is why I think the holiday season from Thanksgiving to the first of the year becomes a good time for families. In fact, we at the church, we try to minimize the things that we do. We try to scale down things that we're doing to keep it simple from this time forward to the first of the year so that we can focus on what, how God has blessed us and how uh, certainly as we celebrate the advent of Christ and we consider the deep things of life that we would settle ourselves for a moment and a season and just try to put a pause, an intentional pause in our life like the psalmist did so oftentimes and to really spend some time reflecting on what the Lord has done for us. And so in this great psalm of thanksgiving, we see that in thanksgiving, the psalmist is doing several things. There are seven exhortations that appear in just five verses, seven commands, seven imperatives that we are to take note of and to put into practice, all of which are rich in meaning and deep in understanding if we will contemplate them and meditate on. That's what meditation does for you, Christian meditation. It allows you to consider something and to contemplate it more deeply and to spend time with it. You can't do this rushing out of the house and only giving God, you know, just a moment, okay? You gotta, this is a time where you sit down before the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm here. Not I'm here for the next five minutes, although I realize sometimes it can be like that. But, but there are times in our life when we got to say, Lord, I'm here. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to sit before you. I'm going to sit before you, come before your presence. I'm going to come before your face, the weight of who you are. And I'm going to meditate on what you have done in my life and who you are toward me. This is what the Psalms allow us to do. And so when we look at Psalm 100 and we look at verses 1 and 2 he says make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth in thanksgiving we approach God in a way that we don't otherwise approach him when we come before the Lord and we come before his presence with singing when we when we when we posture ourselves before God in the right kind of way in thanksgiving we begin to approach him God makes himself approachable to us. Ultimately, we know in Hebrews 4 that we are able to come before the throne of God boldly. Why? Because of the grace of God through Christ Jesus. This is what Hebrews is all about. How Christ made a way for us when there was no way. Christ being our high priest. We come here to worship our great king because he is there. He went there to intercede for us. That's why we come here. 
In fact, the more I began to dig into this word to come into his presence, it's an interesting word. It appears almost 2,600 times in the Bible. You say, wow, pretty weighty word. Almost 2,600 times in the scripture. In the Hebrew language, it's the word bow. Come, bow, come, come before the Lord. Come into his presence. And the idea is, is that you come and you sit and you abide. You don't come and you, you, know, you enter his presence and you just, you jet out of there. So like, I got a little bit of God and I'm out of here. That's not the idea. The idea is that you come and you abide and you remain and you stay. In fact, literally, in one, some of the translations, in a few of those translations of the nearly 2,600 times, it actually uses the word resort. It, and, and, and this is something, the more when you, that you study God's word, this is why I was so refreshed this week in meditating on this verse and particularly this word. He says, come and come into my presence. There is this coming and resorting with the Lord. Now, you know what a resort is, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not a hotel. A hotel is where you go in, you check in, they provide you a room to stay, maybe some clean sheets or something, right? Hopefully no bed bugs. <laughs> you ever had any of those on a trip? Okay, a resort is where you go. It's what we call all-inclusive. You go there not just because you have a bed and food, but because there's entertainment, because there's, there's like the whole package. And that's the idea here. Come before the Lord. Come into his presence. Why? Because he is all-sufficient. He is all-inclusive. He has everything we need. And so if you don't come to him, if you don't resort in him, if you don't resort with him, then you don't experience the all-inclusive nature as to who God is. And so when you come before the Lord and and you enter into his presence, you come and you remain there. One translation of this says that you run into the presence of the Lord. The idea is with intentionality, anticipation that why wouldn't I go to this place? fantastic place and sit before the Lord this all-inclusive one this is not some tribal deity this is the supreme God the covenant maker of Israel we're not talking about worshiping some lesser known we're talking about entering in and worshiping the greatest known the one the Lord God this is the idea and so we don't we don't, we don't enter into his presence and quickly jet out of there, but we run into his presence with this sense, sense of anticipation, say, we're here. And we sit and we remain. And we sit before the Lord. And we consider what he might be saying to us. You know, God is speaking to us. And the Holy Spirit of God is communicating with us and affirming the word that we have written for us and encouraging us through other people and in the many ways that certainly the Lord speaks to us, but primarily through his word. And we sit and we remain and we consider what it means to come before his presence. When we are thankful, we approach God in a way that, in no other way, that, 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 that we enter in and we say, Lord, thank you. I, I, I know what you have done for me. Come and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That there's a sense of excitement. There's a sense of anticipation. There's a sense of that that I am glad to be here. I'm glad to be here because, Lord, you are there. And the idea is that God's people of old, it wasn't that they couldn't worship God where they were at, but this was the the notion is that they would come to the place of worship. They would come to the temple, to a different location. Not that you can't sit at your home and worship the Lord. I know that. And I know you're going to give me that argument. And I know some of them deer hunters out there sitting in a deer stand somewhere saying, "I I can worship the Lord out here. Yeah, that's great, but we need you back in church next week, okay? Come on back. Because there's something that happens when we gather as God's people that doesn't happen when you're sitting in a deer stand or holding a fishing pole or swinging a baseball bat or whatever else you might be doing, okay? You know? It just doesn't happen out there like it happens when God's people are gathered. It happens remarkably in a remarkable fashion when we gather His people. And so in Thanksgiving, we approach, we approach who God is by making a joyful noise, by serving Him with gladness. And there's this vital connection between Thanksgiving and service. Because in, in verse 2, so there, there are three imperatives that we have seen already. Come before his presence. Make a joyful noise. Verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. There's the third imperative. Serve the Lord with gladness. There's this interesting and important connection between someone who is thankful and someone who serves the Lord. I know when someone is thankful to the Lord. 
I know when I am thankful to the Lord. You know how I know it? I'll serve him. And you cannot divide the two. In fact, when you look at this idea, he is our, when, when we come before the Lord and, and we, we, our minds are being transformed, like Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, that we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind, that in doing so, we're able to come and offer up this thing that Paul says is, in our, is our reasonable act of worship. And it's the Greek word latruo. It means worship could be translated service. And this is the same, the same idea here in the Hebrew language, translated out of the Hebrew language. Is it when you worship the Lord and when you do so in thanksgiving, you're going to serve the Lord. When you serve the Lord, you do so because you are thankful to him. There's this vital connection between the two ideas. And so we serve the Lord because we are grateful. We serve the Lord because of what he has done for us. We serve the Lord because we are free, free, free indeed, aren't we? That's what he's done. So when you offer your, your sacrifice of thanksgiving them this morning... You do so, saying to the Lord, I am free. You set me free. You have done this for me. I was imprisoned by my own sin and my own shame and my own guilt. I was wrapped up in me and myself and all that I was about. And you set me free from all of that so that I could be your servant and I could serve you and I could yield my heart to you for eternity. And so Thanksgiving ultimately will materialize itself in service. And so in Thanksgiving, one of the things that we do is that we approach who God is. We become, we, we grow to understand who he is more fully when we are expressing our thanksgiving toward him, when we sit before him and we rush into his presence and we wait there a great deal of time. We've come to see the king and we've come to worship him. There was a little boy who had gone to see the king of England and he, he desperately wanted to see the king. And he stood outside the gates and like a lot of the people hoping to see the king and soon the police came by and were trying to move the people along saying there's no opportunity to see the king today. He said, I, but I've come to see the king, he said, the little boy. You know, as little kids can be so transparent, right? I've come to see the king. They kept shouting that. Soon enough, uh, a well-dressed gentleman showed up and, and uh, he came and he addressed the boy and it seemed like everybody's attention changed at that moment. He reached out, he grabbed the little boy, he took his hand, and he began to walk toward the gate. The guard immediately posted their arms, and the policeman opened the gate. It was as though he was walking with royalty. He walked through the gate and through the quarters of the palace, and soon he was in the presence of the king. What the little boy didn't know, that he was holding the, hands, the hand of the Prince of Wales, the king's son. And that's just how it is with our King Jesus, right? He allows us to enter into the presence of the Father because we are holding his hand. Better yet, because he's holding our hand. He's holding our hand. That's where the security is. In Thanksgiving, we approach the Lord, but I want you to see something else. It's the, really the fourth imperative. But the second primary idea that I want us to get, in Thanksgiving, we approach God. But in Thanksgiving, we apprehend his greatness. We apprehend his greatness in verse 3. Know ye that the Lord is God, that the Lord is God. This is basic theology. This is like, you got to get this part right. You got to know who he is. This is the basic confessional statement of the Bible. Know that the Lord is God. This is a statement of great biblical and theological importance. He's saying that the Lord is God, the one who made covenant with you. He is your God, the one who will make good with his promises. This is the one, know this, that the Lord, Jehovah, is the one who created all things. God, Elohim, who created and brought all things into existence. The one who shaped and fashioned the world as we see it, bringing something out of nothing. The one who did all these things is your Lord. He's the one who made a covenant with you. He made promises. He initiated a covenant with you and he will make good on this. So know this. This is more than intellectualizing your faith, although certainly it does require that we use our minds as a part of loving God. But this is knowing him intimately and personally. This is the word that he uses here. In, in, the, in the original language, he's saying that know this, know him personally and intimately. Know that the one who made this promise to you will fulfill his word. Know this, he is faithful. 
that he is the one who's provided every good gift, like James says in chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. From the Father. He is the one. Know this. And so when we theologize, when we think after God, when we think about God, when we consider who he is, what we're doing is we are apprehending God in our thanksgiving. We're apprehending the magnitude, the greatness of God. We're considering just how big God is, that he's a great God, that that he is greater than I can even conceive of, that this little mind of mine This little pea brain that I have is able to grasp some truth about who he is and that God has made himself known in such a way is an amazing amazing reality. And some of you have greater intellectual capacity than others of us, but with our whole heart, with our whole mind, we are to love God. It is a Christian principle to love him with every ounce of our being, with all of our faculties, everything that we are, that we're to, we're to love him. And so this covenant maker God that he is, as we apprehend who he is, we apprehend he is great. Why is he great? He is great because he said he was going to do certain things and he is making good on all the things that he said he was going to do. And you know something? He hasn't even told us everything yet, but he's still going to make good on things he hasn't even told us about yet. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to know we have a father in heaven who's made this covenant with us because he adopted us into his family he gave us his name we are living it out we're wearing his name and that he has things in store for us that we don't even know about yet and this is what Ephesians says that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we might ask or even think so I know that God is up to something that's bigger than my capacity to consider and when I think about that if I can think just a little bit like this and my mind gets blown can I mean can you imagine what he's up to you know That's how I look at it. Just thinking about that. It's what I know impresses me. But it's the fact that there's so much I don't know that really impresses me about God. That he's still showing and will make himself known throughout all eternity. Well, anyways, I don't know if you're excited, but I am this morning. And in Thanksgiving, we apprehend who God is. We apprehend his personhood. We apprehend his power. It is he who made us. What a beautiful statement in verse 3. It is he who made us. And some of your translations, and I'm using the ESV now, but I love what the King James says because it really, depending on the manuscripts and so forth from which the English is translated from, it says it is he who made us. And the ESV says, and we are his. That's fine, but I love what the King James says when it says, or, and we are not ourselves, or we have not ourselves. And so, in other words, He made us, we didn't. We get this mentality sometimes that we sort of made this good life that we have, that we did it, that somehow we are independent from God and that we created this life that we now live and we did it in such a grand fashion that we are rather impressed with ourselves, more impressed than we are with God. When the psalmist is making very clear that what, who we ought to be impressed with is the Lord, not with ourselves. Although, think about it. How often are you impressed with yourself and less impressed with God? You say, well, I never thought about it like that. I know. I don't think that probably we're sitting around and saying, hey, God, I'm not really impressed with you, but I really am with me. We don't say it like that, but we live it like that, don't we? It's not what we say. But it's how we live, and we live it out that way as opposed to actually saying, Lord, we are really grateful to you because without you, there's no... Listen, I'm grateful because I can't tell you, and I've already acknowledged the McGinnis's this morning, but there is no telling where my life would be without people like this and her family and my life and others. When I think through that, and I'm not just saying it because they're here, you've heard me say this before, but I'm telling you, with people in my life, where would I, I wouldn't be a preacher in a Baptist church. There's no telling where I would be. There's, you know, I just no telling where I would be. I just don't know. But far away from this place, I guarantee you that. But by the grace of a great God, I'm here. And by the grace of God, we're here together, by the way. From everywhere, your stories are just as remarkable as any story that I can tell of the goodness and the greatness of our God in our life and what he has done. He made us. 
He made us, not we ourselves. He shaped us. He made us. He maintains us. He sustains us. He, he moves our lives and he motivates our lives. There's so much that he does. This idea is that he made us is that he accomplished us. That's the literal idea. He accomplished us. He allowed us and, and gave us and the, the ability to. That's what he does. This is, there's so much. When you, just, when you just meditate on the word of God, there's so much, so much to be to consider here. We are his people. Look at this very endearing and pastoral note from the great shepherd. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. What a word of, of comfort. And so what he's saying is that when we, when we express our thanksgiving to the Lord, we apprehend the greatness of God, that he is the covenant maker of Israel. He is the one who's created all things, and he is the one who brings great comfort to our lives. He is the great shepherd. We are the sheep and the sheep in his pasture, and, and we are the ones who are being tended to and cared for by the great shepherd that he is, that he has done this for us, and in every way we can be grateful to the Lord. And then I want us to see in these last few verses, not only do we in Thanksgiving approach God, in Thanksgiving we apprehend his greatness, but in Thanksgiving we appreciate the goodness of God. Notice what he says in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. So come through, those, come through these doors. Do you know how different our worship services would be on another level, another scale? You know, and sometimes in a, a worship team, they practice, they prepare their hearts and so forth. But if you're standing on this side and you're trying to lead a group of people who in the moment, sometimes you're not like really feeling it. You know what I'm saying? I know that. There are times I, same way. But wouldn't it be so much better that as we entered into these doors and we entered into the sanctuary, we come ready, ready from the very first song that's sung. You know what might happen? Revival might just break out in this place. I think revival has been breaking out, in fact. But to, to enter into, to prepare our hearts before we step in, I mean, that means taking a deep breath. This is how it would look like if you have, if you're a parent and you've got toddlers and you're out in your car just before you come in here, okay? You know, you, you're doing all you can to get here. This is how it might look like. Everybody, doesn't mean you're going to fake it, but it means you get there and everyone's, you know, how crazy it's getting there. And you're in the car and right before you leave the car, you just, everyone just say, hey, let's just pause for a moment. Take a deep breath. I mean, you, you almost killed your toddler that morning. It's okay. You're going to make that confession known to the Lord. Lord, he's your child. You gave him to me. He's yours. Or, you know, man, you're saying that. That's the mother's child right there. <laughs> no, we're just, don't say that. I'm sorry, guys. Bad advice. Bad advice. All right. You're not going to make any points there. But no, just as a family, just take a deep breath because it can be crazy moving all your children to the same place. And then you step out of that car and say, Lord, speak to our hearts. And, and Dad, even if you just uttered a private prayer, Lord, speak to our hearts. And that way you enter and you come together with God's people and you expect that he's going to actually do something and, and that you would, in Thanksgiving, that you would come to appreciate, God, you're good, you are great, and, and you are good toward me. First of all, God, you are God. That, that's a good thing to say. God, you're God. <laughs> you are God. I'm not. That's the idea. You made me, I didn't. That's the idea of the psalmist. You made me, you are God. There is no one greater than you. There are no tribal deities. There are no lesser things. There's not, not anything else I could possibly give my attention to at this moment that's greater than you. And there is nothing, by the way, that I could give my attention to that not only would promote your greatest goodness toward me, to, to exalt your goodness toward me, but also would be for my best interest. You know that? That we would exalt the God, our Father, who ultimately, whose, whose hand is reaching out toward us in his goodness. This is a good thing. And we come together and we enter his gates with a sense of thanksgiving, thanking God for the people in our lives, for the family, our friends. And uh, for, for the things that the Lord has done, our parents, our church, our, just everything, the clothes on your back, the food that you enjoy, the, whatever it may be, 
the talents, the gifts that you have, your home, whatever it might be. It could be that you thank God for the things that haven't happened in your life. I mean, there's some people who've had some really rough things happen in this church, our family here, who've had some rough times in their life, difficult times, things of misfortune that has occurred. I love what Matthew Henry writes, a great commentator of old who writes concerning uh, being robbed. He wrote this in his diary. He said, first of all, let me be thankful, first of all, because... I never before have been robbed before now. (laughs) Second, because they took my wallet. They didn't take my life. Third, because all they took, they took all my all, but it wasn't much. (laughs) And fourth, I love this, because it was I who robbed, not I who robbed. Matthew Henry. So is there something to be thankful for? He said, ah, I, I, there's got to be some, something. You know the story of Corey Timboon, don't you, who was banished to Nazi encampment and, and, uh, with, his, with their sister Betsy. They were, they were taken to Ravensbrook, and, and Betsy told her sister, we need to thank God. They had just read from 1 Thessalonians. We need to thank God. The Bible says thank God in all things. And so there they got in, put in the barracks with so many of the other people, just person to person stacked in there one person after the next and every day Corey was told by her sister we need to thank God for all these things the place was it was flea infested she said we need to thank God today for the fleas Corey said I'm not going to thank God for the fleas I can't thank God for the fleas she said Betsy said her sister said you need to thank God for the fleas sure enough she's thanked God for the fleas they were able to have meaningful Bible studies and Christian interaction in that, and, and that encampment. They wondered why the guard never came inside the barracks. It's because of the fleas. That's what they said. And so they would have Christian fellowship and freedom inside there because of fleas? That's the story of Corey Tim. one of the so many stories of Corey Tim. But well, there's something we can thank God for. And we can appreciate the goodness of the Lord because he tells us we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We're to, verse, verse 4, he says, we're to give thanks to him. We're to bless his name. There's the seventh one, the sixth and the seventh commandments. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Bless his name. And then the last thing he says in verse 5, we're to bless his name for the Lord is good his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Three, th- three things, very quickly, but importantly, that we need to consider here. So we appreciate the goodness of God, and we do so thankfully and thoughtfully. Thoughtfully, we think it through, and we consider it as we, we know what God is and why. He's good. The Lord is good. This is the essential fact that you, you cannot miss. Now, listen. We might, you might assume God's good. You may not struggle with that, but I'm telling you, there's a world. You talk with people who don't know the Lord, they struggle with the idea that God is good in a world that's haywire and is in a downward spiral. They struggle with this because the assumption is, is that if God is good and God is capable, then why isn't God doing something about the situation that is at hand in our world or my circumstance? And so they battle with that, and there's an answer to that. We, there's, we gotta, there's, there, there's a lot to be considered there. But fundamentally, basically, we would say, according to Scripture, God is good. His character never changes. And that he is always the same. There's not a bad intention in him, contrary to what some people think. And in great difference to any of us. There's not a bad intention in God. Not one. Or he wouldn't be God. And this is an essential fact. But there's this eternal fact as well. His mercy is everlasting. Now, what does that mean? For you and for me, it means that because of his grace toward us, that he doesn't doesn't come to the end of the road with his mercy toward us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be the forever recipients of the grace and the mercy of God in our life. Forever. We will be the recipients of that. And that's what will hold us forever and ever and ever is the mercy of God, the grace of God. This is the eternal fact. It never ends. It never ceases. For those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will forever be his. Forever. 
But you must believe. The good news is that it, it, it doesn't end for those who believe. But if you do not believe, you have rejected the mercy and the grace of God. The only one who can actually deal with the mess that you are. I mean, let's just be honest. You know it. I know it. Yeah, I know it. You know why I know that you're, you're a mess? Because I was a mess too. And only by the grace of God am I anything at all today. Whatever little that might be, it's because of him. We are all a mess. The Bible says it this way. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the reality of that falling short is hitting us in the face every single day that, that we are coming up short time and time and time and time and time again. We just come up short. And the grace and the mercy of God is able to deal with it. Without it, we don't have anything. With it, we have everything. And the enduring fact, I love this, the last statement, his truth endures to all generations he is a God of yesterday, today, and forever. The same, by the way. Yesterday, today, and forever. Never changed. It doesn't change for me. He's the same. We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We have a lot to be thankful for. I don't know. Maybe you can begin to take, make a list of it, write it down. You have a journal or maybe in the front of your Bible, piece of paper, and just say, Lord, what, this week, take some time. Just maybe turn the television off or the radio off or something. Or, or maybe get off social media. Now that's a thought. And do that for just a little bit. And, and just say, Lord, I'm here. And I'm here because I know you're going to speak to me. And I'm grateful for all that you've done in my life. In Thanksgiving, we apprehend God more fully. We appreciate the greatness of God. We, we come to know him in deeper ways. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you're gracious to us. And we celebrate that. We thank you. We know that apart from it, we have nothing. And yet with it, we have everything. And I pray, Lord, for those this morning that they do not know for certain that they are yours. That they would call upon your name and realize that you're faithful to care for them, that you're faithful to speak to them, that you're faithful to save, to rescue, and that if they will call upon your name now that you are the deliverer, you are the gracious one, you are good, and that will never change. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen.